heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Or who can possibly deal with that, follow that, submit to that? And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? Then he explains in a little bit more detail. Verse 64 said, But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believe not and who should not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore I say unto you that no man can come into me except it were given him, given unto him of my father. From that time many of his disciples went back and walk no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. I want to use that for a title tonight. Who should we follow? Who should we follow I really believe that anyone who really has a desire to know Jesus, to serve him, I believe that you will eventually be led to a crossroads, a place that the stakes will be so high that the consequences of the decision you make there will actually determine your eternity. If we really want the truth of God's word, if we really want to know the truth, God will reveal that to us. He did that here for these disciples. There will always be those that will follow for the loaves and fishes. There will always be those that follow for the miracles, the signs and wonders, whatever is going on that's powerful, that's exciting, we all love the, the service that makes us shout, but no one likes the one where the preacher digs at the root and deals at the things that, that are in our life that shouldn't be there. And they, they can't be trimmed. They're not hedges. They have to be plucked up by the root. And he, he, he shares that with them. They, they've got bellies full and their, their sick have been healed and their dead have been raised to life again. And and they've got their blinded eyes open and their deaf ears have been unstopped and they threw away their crutches and their wheelchairs and they're walking and, and they're, they're, they're well, they're doing great. But then he said that I'm not like the bread that fell in the wilderness. Your fathers ate that and they, they still died. But I'm the bread of life that came down from heaven. He was talking about his body being that bread. And then the Bible said that, that when he made this statement, they were offended. It, it struck a nerve with them. This, this, this preacher that everybody wanted to follow, now he gave them a reason to turn around. And they turned around and went the other way. And he, he asked them the question, doth this offend you? Are you offended by this? It's truth, so if it's truth, you ought to suck it up and deal with it. Isn't that what you want? Don't you want the truth? Amen. We say we do, but it's different when it comes at a cost. And from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no, walked no more with him. So Jesus looked at the 12, those who were the closest, those that had seen more. After he sent the multitudes away, he still stayed with these 12 guys and they jumped on boats and they walked in valleys and deserts and over mountains. He asked the 12 that knew him the best, that, that knew he's not, he's not going to share with them something that they, something that they, uh, that's going to be bad for them. It's going to be the truth if he says it. And he said to them, will you go away? Will you also go away? 
Simon Peter did not say here that they were not hurt, that their feelings were not, were not hurt or their minds were not confused. But he said, where will we go? To whom shall we go? For thou hast the words of eternal life. Amen. If it really is the truth, God will reveal it to us. And then if we still want the truth after we hear it, we're going to have to stay when our feelings are hurt. And we're going to have to stay when the statements and, and have made our minds become confused. I just watched this week a short, a short video clip of a few Christian biblical scholars who are very, they're very prominent in the religious circles now. They're perhaps among the most familiar theologians that news media organizations like to interview or question uh, when it comes to, to issues of moral matters or religious matters that they might be, that, that might be making the news. Maybe it's abortion or, or maybe it's um, something to do with the open borders immigration policy and whether or not Christians should just allow them to come over. If I mentioned their names or showed their pictures, probably most of you, if you watch any news, you would recognize them. In fact, they're so popular and so well-respected that they're often viewed as experts in Protestant Christianity. And they have assumed, I, I think, they have assumed the role as the final authority on matters of religion because they're the ones that everyone goes to when they need an answer. The secular media... The secular media assumes that because they're classified as doctors or professors or theologians that they're always right. And they treat them like collaborating scientists that have officially settled the issue once and for all. They laid it to rest and no one else is allowed to question them. So whatever you say after they speak, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. <clears throat> Now, don't get me wrong, I don't disparage their scholarship. <clears throat> there are many years of dedicated study of the scripture or church history. We need people that will do that. I'm simply saying I don't care how many degrees they have or how many news agencies consider them to be the experts or the final authority on traditional Christianity. I am not a traditional Christian. We are Orthodox Christians. Amen. I didn't know that until I was in Israel talking to a rabbi and he wanted to know what I believed. When I explained it to him, I said, we are the day of Pentecost church. I explained, we believe it like they do. He said, then you are Orthodox Christianity. I wasn't offended by that. I was thrilled by that. The Catholic church is not Orthodox Christianity. It is traditional Christianity. And I can tell you that I don't care how many degrees they have, how expert other folks think they are, they don't speak for me. And they probably don't speak for most Christian denominations. The Catholic church has many historians and theologians who are also highly educated, including the Pope. And yet they also don't speak for me because their message is not in the Bible. In addition, we in the apostolic church also have highly qualified doctors and professors and theologians who are also experts in biblical studies, and they can also speak and write fluent Greek and Hebrew. In fact, we have a few in our ranks that have even memorized the whole Bible or the majority of it. So here's the point. Just having knowledge alone is not necessarily the greatest qualifier for scriptural understanding because every denomination has their own experts that they rely on for doctrinal clarification. Amen. Jesus told the Jews, he said, these, these were experts, experts in the scriptures now. He told the experts in the scripture in John 5, 39, he said, search the scriptures. Look at them again. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. You've missed something. Right. Amen. You might have the right pieces, but you lack the understanding. You lack the, the ability to put any of the pieces together correctly. 
Jesus didn't suggest to the Jews that they needed a new Bible. They had the right Bible. What they lacked was not the right Bible. What they lacked was a revelation or a clear understanding of what it meant because what good is knowledge without understanding? you got to have them both. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 and 1, he said, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now, here's a place where we, I think we get sidetracked here or, or we, we got one eye focused on one direction and we miss what he's really saying. He said, perilous times are coming. He's talking to Timothy. He said, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. And when we read that, we conclude, man, we are in that world today. He is certainly talking about the world we're living in right now. And he is. He is. But wait a minute. He's not just talking about the world. He's not just talking about men in the world. Because he said, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. He goes through all the litany there. And then verse 5, he's telling us it's the church world too. He said, for they have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. We always read the verse and conclude he's talking about the world, but he's not just talking about the world. He's talking about the church world as well. He said, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women. That's women that are susceptible to flattery and praise, laden with sins, led away with divers lusts. He's still talking about false, pro uh, false prophets or deceptive teachers that seek to prey on the weak or the simple-minded who are easily led away. They're easy to deceive. And so he said in verse 7, they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, we stop there, but he continues to warn Timothy about the weakening of the gospel message that will try to make inroads into the church in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. He said, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Can I tell you what he just got done saying in chapter 3? It sounds like they need a lot of rebuke and correction and instruction. He's going to have to be long suffering with them. Because they're worldly minded even in the church. Even in the ministry he was warning him about those that are worldly minded. And they're teaching things that are contrary to the gospel. So he tells him, they're, they're deceiving people, but you preach the word. Don't follow their lead. Preach the word. Stand out from them. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. We've got to have somebody in this generation that stands up in the midst of all the nonsense and says, hold on. That is not what the word of God said, and we're not going to follow down that path. We need to get somebody in this generation that will stand up and say, we're not going there. We're not going to partake in that. We're not going to be a part of that. You can separate me from your group from your friendship, from your organization. You can defriend me, whatever you want to do, but we're going to follow the word of God and we're not going to be apologetic for it. He said, for the time will come. This is what's going to happen, Timothy. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. The message will not be anointed in the future. It's going to be accommodating. Amen. That's what he's telling him. The message will not be anointed in the future. It's going to be accommodating. It's going to be about what the people want. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth 
and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I dealt with them too. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. I didn't waver from what I started preaching. And I'm encouraging you to do the same thing. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Now let's go back to the scholars for just a minute. In this interview or this roundtable panel discussion, they were examining and explaining why Miracles and signs and wonders do not exist in the church anymore. They were claiming that the early church actually needed the gifts of the Spirit and the signs and wonders and miracles for one thing, to establish the New Testament church until the foundation of the church operations were written and distributed to the other churches. All we need the power of signs and wonders and miracles for is till we can get our, our church bylaws written. Let's get all of the fundamental letters together and we'll send them throughout the churches. Send it to Corinth and let them read the letter and then let them send it to Thessalonica and then let them send it to Galatia. And, that, and once everybody's got the letters and everybody knows how we're going to go from here, we don't need signs and wonders and miracles. Man, I'm glad I didn't meet folks like that before I met Pentecostal fanatics. Amen. My family came out of Catholic, Baptist, Assemblies of God, Nazarene, and I thank God that somewhere along the way they settled on this oneness apostolic message. I have known all of my life that in the church there's power. If you got a problem, you get to the church. If you need a healing, get to the church. If you need a miracle, get to the church. We expected it was going to happen, and God did it. And here I am today after all these years, and I thank God he is more real to me now than he's ever been. I've seen more signs and wonders and miracle in my life than many of these people that say it's dead, it's gone, it's not coming back. I don't care what they call it. I'm telling you it's real. It's real. I know it's real. It's a Pentecostal blessing, and I know it's real. I'm glad we get the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues, but I'm glad there's power in your touch. There's power in your word. You have authority in the word of God. You have power in the name of Jesus. And if you'll trust God and use it, you can see the supernatural take place. But after the instructions for church government... Church structure, church order was established. Then they declared that the, uh, the supernatural manifestations of the Spirit, the signs, the wonders, and miracles, they ceased to operate in the Christian church. Because, and I, I can't even imagine making a statement like this, because they were no longer necessary, <laughs> no longer needed. When they said that, been in this a long time, several things became very, very clear to me. In fact, it reminded me of what Paul asked the disciples of John in Acts 19 and 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Paul was scratching his head. He said, He said unto them, That doesn't make any sense. That don't make any sense. How can you be a believer and yet you do not have the Holy Ghost? That don't make any sense. We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, hmm, unto what then were you baptized? Something's, if I'm going to go back a little bit, I'm going to find out what's wrong. If you got, if you're a believer, you ought to have the Holy Ghost. And they said unto John's, they, he said, how were you baptized? They said unto John's baptism. Paul said, 
Now I see the problem. You didn't have to go back very far and dig back up in your past and see if you were mistreated as a child or if you got set on the wrong side of the classroom in school and, and did somebody call you a him or a her or whatever you want to be called. What the reason you're offended? No, I see the problem right away. You're a believer and you do not have the Holy Ghost. Paul said, I see the problem. John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come out after him that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this they were baptized. They were rebaptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and when Paul laid his hand upon them the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. You know why these men these theologians, these professors, these experts these doctors, you know why they believe it died because they themselves have no power. They did not, uh, they did not obey the word of God. They have not been baptized in his name and they were not filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So they're walking in darkness. They're like the Pharisees. They need to go back and search the scripture. Hey, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but I'm not on an apology tour tonight. I'm telling you there's one gospel. There's one message. There's one salvation plan. And if you want to have, have the power of God in your life, that resurrection power, you got to go back and obey the gospel. Paul said, I know what the problem is now. I know why you're religious, but you're dead. I know why you're religious, but you have no power. I know why you're religious and you don't know the rest of the truth. They heard that Jesus was coming, but the message had not got to them yet. They didn't know that he died. He rose from the dead. He, they didn't know that he was buried. They didn't even know he was born. They just heard John say, there's one coming, and when he comes, you follow him. Whatever he says, do, you do what he says. And they were waiting for him to come. But Paul said, I want to tell you, he has already already come. It was awesome. He was born in a manger. He, 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 he was 33 years old, had a powerful ministry of signs and wonders and miracles, and all of a sudden he was crucified. They rejected him, but God raised him from the dead, and now his blood is able to cover every sin. You need to go back and get baptized in the blood, not a symbol of repentance. Go back and get baptized in the power of the blood, in the name of Jesus. And when he laid hands on them, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. So when I heard these experts, so-called experts, claim that miracle signs and wonders don't happen in the church anymore, I could clearly see the problem. I could see the reason that they're content with dead church. They believe that signs and wonders and miracles, because somebody would say, well, what do you think? What about these people that are having miracles? And they believe that signs, wonders, and miracles are actually just a fundraising hoax used by televangelists who are scamming the poor. This is also why they have to conclude that salvation is by faith alone. Because once they have denied the power, they can't feel God. I want you to listen to me. They can't feel anything. Amen. They can't feel anything. When people have been in the church for years and stand and ask these professors, these experts, these men, say, I've been saved 30 years. I, I was saved 30 years ago, but I never felt any different. How can I know for sure that I'm saved? They always respond, you're not supposed to feel anything. Salvation is a free gift, and it's by faith alone. So if you say the sinner's prayer and you meant it with all your heart, then you're saved. You just got to have faith faith that you're saved. I can assure you I've been hearing preachers say that all of my life. They've been saying the same thing and yet just this week it's really starting to get under my skin. It's really starting to annoy me on a whole nother, nother level. They can criticize televangelists on TV for fundraising on miracle scams uh, but these same experts have been selling a powerless form of Christianity for years uh, as they convinced the religious world that powerless Christianity 
Christianity is what God always intended for his church. I refuse to buy into that. That's a bunch of nonsense. Dead religious traditions, that may be what you're satisfied with, but that's not what that's not what's going to keep me. I need to know he's alive and well. I need to know I can feel him. I can experience him. I can feel his power. I can interact with him, and he's going to be right there to minister to me. If God no longer operates in the supernatural anymore, then why have a prayer request? Why have a prayer line? Why in the world do we even have a prayer meeting? Why would we pray about anything? Why not just accept life and death and suffering and despair as it comes? Why ask God to get involved in anything? But when we come to the house of God, when we're sitting at home and we feel that heaviness of the world settle on us, you know what? I feel the Holy Ghost saying, why don't you call out? Why don't you call upon the name of Jesus and when you do you're going to feel peace that passes all understanding I just read a quote recently from Maria Woodworth Etter one of the early Pentecostal pioneers from the late 1800s early 1900s she said that no amount of reasoning or preaching theories or denouncing people's sins convinces the world that God lives and moves on earth today as it does the fact that the blind see and the deaf hear and the paralyzed walk again, end of quote. That's what I believe. I've been preaching that for, for a long time here. I believe it's going to get some people's attention because I believe there is a powerful moving of the Holy Ghost that's going to sweep in our congregations. I've told you many times before, it's not going to be so a preacher gets a pat on the back. Nobody's going to get glory for what God does, but the Spirit of God is going to breathe on the congregation. A word of faith, a word of healing, a great miracle spirit is going to move and people are going to be healed and then people are going to be lined up at the door saying, where did you get that from? People that know you and see you healed, they're going to say, how in the world did that happen? And we're going to say, it wasn't the preacher, it wasn't the oil bottle, it wasn't the prayer line, it was the power of God that moved and they're going to know he's alive and well. The revival in Asbury, Kentucky was a perfect example of the wholesale rejection of the powerless religion that's been sold to the masses. People that have been taught for years by the scholars, the experts, who say the days of miracles and signs and wonders are over. But many pastors came from all around the world to Asbury, not to hear a preacher, not to hear a preacher, not to hear a song. They went in there to sit in a building where people were praying. The people stayed there and they kept on praying. They did it for weeks, several months maybe. They were doing it because the atmosphere was so charged with repentance. The sovereign move of God came down. He filled that house and people could feel him. They didn't need to hear a sermon. You don't have to play a song. We don't need somebody to give us any instructions. We don't need a program handed to us to tell us how long it's going to last and when you can expect to finally get to go home. You're going to sit in the presence of God and it's going to move. And when the people were out in the front yard, they would feel it and people would start weeping. Mothers standing out there wrapped up in blankets holding their babies while the snow and rain is flying. It's cold and they're standing out there rocking back and forth waiting for four and five hours so they could walk into the building and sit down in a seat for 20 or 30 minutes and feel the presence of God before they had to move out of there and let someone else have their seat. They were willing to fly around the world to do that. And many of them preachers went back to their home church with a new passion and desire and determination. We're going to abandon dead formalities, dead traditions, dead rituals and program. We're going to focus solely on getting into the presence of the Lord and then we're going to follow wherever it leads. That ought to be the way all of our services start. We ought to walk in expecting the goal is to get into the presence of the Lord. The goal is to find uh, the healing virtue of the power of God. It's present in this place. I just want to be able to sense it. We already know exactly where their hunger is going to lead. It always leads them to a Pentecostal experience. 
They went in there into a, a Wesleyan uh, sanctuary and they were speaking in tongues laying out in the floor. They don't get that in the Wesleyan church, but they get it when you seek for God and he takes you back to a Pentecostal experience. Nobody in the upper room knew what it was to be filled with the Holy Ghost, but the Bible said suddenly, after 10 days of waiting, all of a sudden, suddenly, there came a sound from heaven. Things begin to shake and they could hear a noise and nobody knew what it was. It was a rumbling. It was a roar. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it set upon each of them and they were all, every one of them were there for the right reason and for the right purpose and the right goal and they all were filled with the Holy Ghost and began Begin to speak in other tongues. We need a baptism of Pentecost in this hour. We need it in denominal churches. We need it in everybody's churches. The Holy Ghost was falling at at Asbury on people and preachers. Some of them confessed on their way out. We thought it died with the apostles. <laughs> My God. When you get hungry enough to find the truth, if you keep on digging, keep on digging. Say, well, I got, I got some truth. Don't stop there. There's more. If you have not been filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues yet, keep digging. There's more. You say, well, how much more I got to go? I don't know. Maybe it's one more shovel full. Maybe it's one more verse of Scripture. Maybe it's one more enlightening revelation that God's going to give to you. But I'm telling you, when you hit it, you hit the mother load. When you hit it, you got healing. You got signs and wonders and miracles. I, I don't let the experts tell you it's dead. I'm telling you it's alive and well. He is still able to do today exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think. You're going to find when you keep digging, you hit the foundation, and the foundation you'll uncover is Acts 2.38, which is the true source of power. Jesus said, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. What kind of power is that? Somebody tells you, well, you got to receive it by faith alone. Well, I've been serving God for 30 years. I've never felt any different. Never felt anything. Can you, can you tell me how I know for sure? How do I know for sure? Man, if you've got, you got a flashlight with fresh batteries in it and it won't turn on, you know them little plastic tabs they stick in there sometimes? It comes with batteries, but they don't leave the batteries on because kids keep turning them on. So they put a little tab in there to stop that battery from making contact. If you've got, if you love God and you've been in the church for years and you still have not felt the power of God, you still have not received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you can say, well, I don't go to a Pentecostal church. You can get it in a Baptist church. You can get it in an assembly church. It don't matter where you're, where you're going. You can get it at work. You need to pull that tab out and hook up to the power. The power is in Pentecost. It's the true source of the power and Jesus said you'll have power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you and I promise you you will feel it the New Testament church turned the world upside down because they were filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. Your programs may be dead. Your traditions may be dead. But I can tell you the church is not dead. And God is not dead. People focused on the 21st century have completely left God out of all their planning sessions. They hope he shows up. Even though they're more focused on meeting the desires of the people than they are serving the desires of God. This is the problem for the 21st century church. Everything's geared to what do the people like? What do the people want? How long do the people want to stay? What will attract the most people? Several years ago, apparently, I don't know whose church it was, but there was 
a visitor that must have walked, must have walked into one of our churches somewhere across the country. And someone greeted them by saying, praise the Lord, we're glad to have you. They were confused by that because they'd never been in a church before. My, my wife's brother brought a visitor. She sat in the church next to him. People walked by and said, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, going down the line, praise the Lord. When they came to her, they shook her hand and said, praise the Lord. She said, thank you very much. We laughed and laughed and laughed. Her brother sat there and laughed and laughed at her too. <laughs> However, instead of somebody just explaining to the visitor that it's just a traditional Christian greeting in the Psalms, other denominations use that too. It's like saying, hey, or what's up? Instead of hello. Hello. And the same thing applies when we address each other as brother and sister in the church. We don't have to have special new convert classes to explain that. If you say praise the Lord to someone and they think it's a little strange, what, what are you talking about? Just take a second, just 15 seconds to explain it. It's just a Christian greeting. I said, so what, what am I supposed to do? You don't have to do anything. We don't need classes on that. But apparently somebody must have brought this up at a district national business meeting because all of a sudden it appeared they had stumbled on the reason why churches struggle to grow or maintain growth. Who knew? That's why churches were not growing. Who knew? So pastors must have went home, got an emergency meeting with the church members and staff, got to ado adopt a new policy for church greetings, encourage everyone to drop the brother and sister titles and just, let's just call everybody by their first name, start greeting each other without saying praise the Lord. Apparently it's, it's, it's less confusing to just say, what's up? You know? That's, that's what I've heard. <laughs> but this is not the only thing that church organizations and church growth departments have concluded after in-depth research, a lot of brainstorming sessions. Once, once in a while, Fox News will play a montage. I think Rush Limbaugh was probably the first to do that where a dozen or more news outlets were all covering the same story they would all use the same word or phrase exactly in the same context, in the same order. Of course, it's not a coincidence. Rush Limbaugh, let everybody see that. It's the same talking points that were distributed to every news outlet to ensure that they all promote the same liberal political agenda. It's actually pretty amusing. It's funny. I think this is what happened in the church organization as well. Because in the last several years, most of our churches are adopting the same church programs, platform styles, lighting features, music genres, even friendly, guilt-free, conviction-free sermons, conviction-free altar services. When Jesus was speaking to the Jews he was speaking to the world's most knowledgeable scriptural scholars of the time. And yet he told them here in John 5, 39, search the scriptures for in them, ye think ye have eternal life and they are they which testify of me and ye will not come to me that you might have life. You won't follow me because you don't understand the scriptures. Nearly every product you buy has a list of instructions for you to follow so you can get the most out of that product. Also, so you can use it safely. 
But if you read all the instructions and you still are not clear as to um, maybe maybe the product maybe the product didn't work like it said it was going to work or you couldn't get it put together, whatever it is, they have a toll-free number listed that encourages encourages you call this number for more information. Usually, when you call, it's going to be a surprise. They have no new information. Nothing else to share with you than what was already included in the printed instructions that came with the product. So why do they want you to call it? So they can walk you through it again, just in case you miss something. They try to include everything, uh, anything or everything that would or could be relevant to you as a customer because they don't want to have to have somebody manning the telephones to answer common questions that could be answered by you if you just take the time to read the instructions and that's all I'm trying to do here tonight. I just want to read some instruction to you. The Bible makes it very clear that there is nothing more serious than the saving of your eternal soul. We've all heard it said that it is illegal to scream fire in a crowded theater because of the panic that will follow. It could get people hurt or even killed. And yet sometimes I feel like we've been watching the a building burn for a long time now and no one ever bothers to speak up. But now I think we've reached that place where somebody needs to be screaming that the building's on fire because if we wait too much longer, we're going to be out of time and we're not going to be able to save anybody. I, again, I didn't come to be politically correct or to begin an apology tour. I'm not tiptoeing through people's feelings. If your feelings are hurt, I'm sorry. But I want to help you. I want to tell you the building is on fire. And now is not the time for the church to calm down or to be silent. The church world desperately needs a revelation. There is a power of God that wants to settle upon the world. Not just in, in the apostolic church, but in every church. He wants to to turn them around. If we're going to have a billion soul revival in a short amount of time, it's not going to happen in this building. It's going to take every building and every yard if we're going to have that kind of a move of God. When Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, you better know what that will is. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter in. Amen. I've stressed to you several times in the past few weeks. Prophecy is already written. It's not going to change. You can't change it. You can't postpone it. You can't alter it. You can't, you can't cancel it regardless of how much you pray against it. And the word of God is the same. It is already settled. It's already established. It will not change for anyone because there is no more new information to share with you. Jesus said it here in verse 22. He said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and thy name have cast out devils in thy name done many wonderful works Then I will profess unto them. I never knew you depart from me. ye that work iniquity. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. These were a dead thieves. They didn't keep his commandments, and yet they used the authority of his name and his word. Matthew 25 and 11 said in the parable of the ten virgins, afterward came also other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. And Luke 6 and 46, and why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings, and doeth them I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. This word is a rock. It's a rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon that house, it could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth against which the storms did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that 
house was great. Luke 13, 24, he said, strive to enter in. That word strive means to struggle, endeavor, go all out, make every effort, do your best, try hard to enter in at the straight gate. For many, many I say unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able. I don't want to be among that many that tried and I failed. He said, when once the master of the house is risen up and has shut the door and you begin to stand out and to knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he shall answer it and say unto you, I know you not when ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, you're trying to make a case for yourself. We have eaten and drunk in thy presence. Listen to this. And thou hast taught in our streets. They admitted that they heard his instruction. They heard his word and yet they failed to obey it. They tried to remind him, but he said unto them, I tell you, I know you not when ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. Matthew 7, 13, enter in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. You're not going to stumble on it, he said. You got to search for it. So beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. You're responsible to avoid the deceivers and those that are going to try to steal your crown. If they're offering you an easier way, reject it. There's no power in an easier way. There's no authority in an easier way. Go back to the book of Acts and do what the Word of God said and you'll have power to live it. You'll have power to, to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. You're going to have power that can only come from God. Peter said, Acts 2, 40, and with many other words did he testify and say, exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. 2 Peter 1 and 10, Peter said, wherefore the rather brethren give diligence. That means be careful and meticulous. Be thorough and detailed, painstaking and fussy to make your calling and election sure. Don't take any chances. You got to get it right. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. If the greatest scholars of the, of the day of Jesus could not see him in the Old Testament scriptures or in the confirmation, the witness of John the Baptist, Jesus was telling them, you didn't just miss something. You missed everything. You missed everything. I mentioned to you many times before, just because someone has the title of doctor in front of their name doesn't mean they have all the answers. Every religion, more than 1,500 Christian religions in America, they all have men and women there with doctors of theology in their ranks. Many of them speak fluent Greek and Hebrew. It's not the test. It's not the confirmation. That just means they've exhausted all the available study materials that were presented to them in the particular religious universities they attended. That's all it means. The Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Catholics, they all, have, they all have scholars in their ranks, just like we do. The old doctorate degrees. But I would not look to them for biblical answers because many of them don't even believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. So my question has always been, since we don't know anyone on earth today who's alive, who spoke directly with Jesus or his apostles, who's the one man? Who's the one man in history that steps on the scene with all the, the answers that the rest of us should follow? If the word of God and the inspired writings of his apostles cannot be trusted, then tell me who is the man that we should all flock to and follow? Who should we trust? Was it the pagan emperor Constantine who set the foundation for the Catholic Church while also officiating in pagan temples? Should we trust his views because he, through the art of compromise, managed to merge the pagan and Christian churches together to one unified religion? Should we embrace the reformers' pushback from Martin Luther who rebelled against the Catholic Church by rejecting many of their doctrines? Well, not so fast because he was also an anti-Semite. 
encouraged the killing of Jews and the burning of their synagogues. He translated the Bible from, uh, from uh, Latin or from into the German language instead of the Latin language like it was supposed to be done. He made it more accessible to the common man, even influenced other translators like Tyndall. But is that enough reason to follow him? Well, there were other reformers like John Calvin. He also laid the foundation for the Baptist church. He rebelled against the Catholic church, but he set the foundation for the Baptist church in the 16th, 17th centuries. Should we follow Joseph Smith, Charles Taze Russell, Brigham Young? They all claim to have brand new revelations and even new hidden scriptures that would change everything. Look, I can spend a lot of time going through these. They were all men that spent no time with Jesus. Why should any of us trust them? There has never been a man born after the apostles had died that had any new authority, knew any, insight, any new insight from heaven that would give them the right to change, to alter, or manipulate the message. In fact, Paul said to the Galatian church in Galatians 1 and 6, he said, I marvel. It shocks me. I'm shocked to see it, that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and should pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. This is something I've struggled with all my life. Because I can understand how people can be so cavalier, so casual and careless and reckless with their eternal souls. Paul made it very clear that most people turn to the Christian church because they really do want to be saved. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Surely they're aware that they do need God and they really don't want to be eternally lost. But most people just pick a religion. They just pick one because they don't know where to start. But if it's important enough to serve the Lord, to save your eternal soul, shouldn't it be just as important to make sure that you do it right and you're obeying his word, you're following his plan? The very reason we even had a Reformation period is because of those who challenged the non-biblical doctrines of the state-run Catholic Church. However, the pursuit of truth stopped once they found a way to validate their own belief system because they failed to go back to the beginning of the New Testament church in the book of Acts. And the same approach to Bible study for validation is still going on today. The book of Judges, it's like it was back then. And that's the way it is today. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Preachers, pastors, saints of God. Your salvation cannot be based on believing in Jesus alone. You need to go back to Acts chapter 2 if you want the authentic born-again experience that comes with power. You say, well, I've, I've known God. I've known the Lord for years, been saved for years. I don't have the Holy Ghost. You need to go back to Acts chapter 2 for some more information. You need to go over it again. It's not about validation. It's, about, it's not about winning an argument. It's not even about preserving your religious traditions. It's about saving your eternal soul. The house is on fire. Don't trust the reformers. Don't trust the educated with all their degrees. Paul said, don't even trust apostles or angels from heaven if they preach any other gospel. If you want the truth... You have to go back to the book of Acts. Many people say they know they're saved, and I'm closing. They think they're saved because they say the sinner's prayer. But they don't even know where it came from. They don't even know where it came from. When you ask them, show me where that is in the Bible, it's complete silence. Even preachers, try it. It's complete silence. They look like a deer in the headlights. If you go to Wikipedia, you look up the sinner's prayer, you'll be shocked to discover its origins. Let me quote here from Wikipedia. I'll go really, really fast here. 
says the sinner's prayer, also called the consecration prayer and salvation prayer, is an evangelical Christian term referring to any prayer of repentance prayed by an individual who feels convicted of the presence of sin in their lives and who have the desire to form a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It is a popular phenomenon in evangelical circles. It's intended to be the act, an act of initial conversion to Christianity. While some Christians see the reciting of the sinner's prayer as the moment defining one's salvation, others see it as the beginning step of one's lifelong faith journey. A minister or other worship leader will invite those desiring to receive Christ thus to become born again to repeat with him or her the words of some form of a sinner's prayer while urging the people to repeat these words from the bottom of your heart. The use of the sinner's prayer is common within some Protestant denominations such as Baptist churches, Methodist churches, as well as movements that span several denominations including evangelical, fundamental, and charismatic Christianity. It's also been used, though not as widely, by some Anglians and Lutherans and even Roman Catholics. However, it goes on to say that the sinner's prayer is not without critics because no such prayer or conversion is found in the Bible. Some biblical scholars have even labeled the sinner's prayer as a cascade of nonsense and an apostasy. Dr. David Platt, who pastors a mega church in Birmingham, Alabama, Alabama, graduated with a doctorate degree from New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. He has raised questions over the authenticity of the conversions of people who use the sinner's prayer based on research by George Barna. The sinner's prayer is popularly known today, has its root in Protestant Christianity. Some affirm that it evolved in some form or another during the early days of the Protestant Reformation as a recitation against as a reaction rather against the Roman Catholic dogma of justification by means of meritorious Mary, 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 meritorious works that's a word I don't use a lot others believe it originally originated as late as the 18th century revival movement however Paul Harrison Chitwood in his doctrinal dissertation on the history of the sinner's prayer provides strong evidence that the sinner's prayer originated in the early 20th century evangelists such as Billy Graham and evangelistic organizations such as Campus Crusade for Christ brought the concept to prominence in the 20th century Televangelists often ask viewers to pray a sinner's prayer with them one phrase at a time to become a Christian. An early advocate of the sinner's prayer was the well-known evangelist, American evangelist D.L. Moody. In 2012, the Peace with God organization and other even evangelical organizations and preachers Preachers, messengers, delegates to the Southern Baptist Convention and their annual meeting reaffirm the sinner's prayer after some debate. We affirm that repentance and faith involving a crying out for mercy and a calling on the Lord, Romans 10 and 13, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, which is often identified as a sinner's prayer, as a biblical expression of repentance and faith. However, they went on to say a sinner's prayer is not an incantation that results in salvation merely by its recitation and should never be manipulated, employed, or utilized apart from a clear articulation of the gospel. And the criticisms continue. The absence of any specific example of people praying the sinner's prayer in the Bible is also used by some to argue against it. There are also no examples of conversions in the Bible with, pre with sinners praying such a prayer. However, more prominent concerns voiced by those who say it creates within the sinner a false sense of security. Dr. David Platt, a prominent Southern Baptist pastor in Birmingham, Alabama, has said that many assume that they're saved simply because a prayer they prayed. It is not that the prayer is in, uh, is in and of itself is bad, but the question is what kind of faith are we calling people to? She said, speaking at the Verge church leaders conference he said the emphasis on the sinner's prayer is unbiblical and damning he said I am convinced that many people in our churches are simply missing the life of Christ and a lot of it has to do with what we have sold them as the gospel in essence we tell them to pray this prayer accept Jesus into your heart invite Christ into your life he said should it not concern us that there is no such superstitious prayer in the New Testament should it not concern us that that the Bible never uses the phrase accept Jesus in your heart or invite Christ into your life. It is not the gospel. And we 
we see being preached in modern evangelical churches, it is built on sinking sand, and it runs the risk of delus delusioning millions of souls. He goes on to say, he is concerned that some people say to believe in Jesus, uh, that they have accepted their Savior, that they have received Jesus, but they are not saved, and they will not enter into the kingdom of God. While he affirmed that people calling unto God with repentant faith and fundamentals to attain eternal life or salvation, he said his comments about the sinner's prayer have been deeply motivated by a concern for authentic conversions. Francis Chan, a well-known evangelical Christian, has also been making statements that contradict the sinner's prayer, and instead he emphasizes the need for baptism and the receiving of the Holy Spirit. When there are men in that organization or in those denominations that have for years been looked at as the experts, and now some of the experts are saying, I'm not sure about this. We don't, we're not Catholic because it's not biblical. And why are we selling a non-biblical doctrine to the masses, making them think they're saved by repeating that prayer? I can tell you, there's power in the Holy Ghost Amen. And if you want power, resurrection power, you need Christ in you. And I'm telling you, you can talk to a billion people on the face of the earth that have received the Holy Ghost, and it's far more than just faith. It's far more than just some chill bump feeling. It's not shaking a preacher's hand. It is power. It'll be with you when you're all by yourself. You can feel him when you get together and magnify God with the body of Christ, but you can feel him when you're by yourself. When you're in an emergency, he is there. You can speak in tongues in your car. You don't have to come to the house of God to feel him. You can speak in tongues working in your garden. You can speak in tongues at work. I don't care where you are. You can be on a fishing bank and you can call out to the Lord and begin to exalt him and praise him. Tell, tell him how great he is and he'll come and abide with you and you'll feel the power of God. Stand with me today. He goes on to say here, many Christians make the cataclysmic and unbiblical mistake of giving the other person a false sense of assurance of salvation by asserting that a person is saved because he prayed a sinner's prayer. He said, therefore, so many people walk away from such a conversion <laughs> still dead in their sins, but believing what they have been told. I prayed a prayer, so now I'm a Christian. Other critics say the sinner's prayer was not even practiced before the 1700s. We, we go back to the book of Acts. Some people like to debate about which verse we should listen, listen to. Whatever Jesus told the disciples, whatever he instructed them, we see it in motion. If you don't understand what he told them, you can understand it by reading the book of Acts because they demonstrate how that was to be done. Peter said, save yourselves. The book of Acts tells you how to do that. Paul said, make your calling and election sure. The book of Acts tells you how to do that. Jesus said in the New Testament church, when he was talking to the New Testament church, he was, he was telling the Jews to search the scripture. He didn't have a New Testament to give out. They didn't have a New Testament to refer to. What are you saying, Brother Moses? The book of Romans didn't even exist for 25 years after the Holy Ghost was poured out. It didn't even exist. The Gospel of Matthew didn't exist for 32 years after Pentecost. The book of Mark was 30 years after Pentecost. Luke was 31 years. John was 60 years. So none of them existed when Peter was preaching in the book of Acts to repent and be baptized every one of you 
in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So for those that say, I'd rather believe Matthew 28, 19, I want to believe the words of Jesus. Matthew didn't exist. It didn't even exist for 32 years. The book of Acts is the more information book that clearly tells us how everything was to be applied. Amen. Everything Jesus preached or taught, the book of Acts tells us how it was applied. We need a revival of the book of Acts. I know I've kept you for a long time. I want to open these altars, give you a chance to find a place to pray. If you want power, you're not going to get it just by believing, convincing yourself that you believe in what you can't feel, you can't sense. When you need him, you don't know if he's there or not. You don't know if he hears you. You don't know if he's alive or not. You need the power of the Holy Ghost to cause an awakening inside of you. And he'll pour it out on you if you want it.